am a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb. I shall not fear to want His cause or bless to speak His word. Though the battle may be hard and the conflict sore, rough and rocky the road, we're traveling on, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land. Sure I must fight if I would reign, increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain. Supported by thy word Though the battle may be hard And the conflict sore Rough and rocky the road We're traveling on Hold on a little longer Take Jesus by the hand He'll guide us safe To the glory land Though the battle may be hard and the conflict sore, rough and rocky the road, we're traveling on, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land. And the conflict sore, rough and rocky the road, you're traveling on, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand. He'll guide us safe to the glory land. Indeed. Hold on a little longer. Take Jesus by the hand this morning. Hold on a little longer. Take Jesus by the hand. The battle hard and the conflict sore. Rough and rocky the road. You're traveling on, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land. Hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land. Praise God this morning. Welcome to Thursday morning, January the 19th, a study in God's Word on the My Falls Faith Network only. We're on Facebook and uh, as well, and those are the only two networks we're broadcasting on this morning. We're grateful that you're with us today, and we encourage you to share the channel out to folks, have them subscribe to us. We're almost at 1,000. We're building it back slowly. We had about 15,000 subscribers, and we will get back there eventually. We lost this, this channel back. I guess about six months ago, thanks to some childish behavior by certain individuals on the internet, but it's okay. I'm used to it, and uh, but we're grateful that we are got these 800 folks we got, and I'm noticing the crowd in here is getting about as big as the e-network, so it really ultimately is evened out. Subscribers don't necessarily mean listeners every night, and uh, we're grateful for it, and uh, if you're not subscribed to our e-network, please do. We're shedding a lot of listeners over there for various reasons and um, if you know some folks that would like some fun times some Mac fun Mac foolery and some Mac fire send our channels out have them subscribe to it and so forth let me remind you this morning we um, 
our uh, our website is uh, the macfiles.org, but also macfilesfaith.com is our faith website. We're trying to figure out what we're going to do with these Bible studies. We need to get them on there for you uh, to go back and listen to. They're, we're not going to take them down. We do have a Telegram room we're working on populating, and I'll send you the link to that and uh, so forth. But listen, we're grateful that you're here today, and we hope that you will um, be blessed and have an anointed time with us today. Now, I want to get back this morning real quick to the teaching that we did yesterday. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, trying to rehash a lot of the stuff from yesterday. Some of the stuff we will, but we're going to try to put these Bibles back to back for a reason. So that's today's verse of the day. Whenever I pull this King James Version Bible up, they have a verse, a daily verse. And today's is, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down and when thou risest up, speaking of God's word, Deuteronomy 6 and 7, what a great verse. And that's exactly what we need to be doing to our children and those that we love today. It's very true. Genesis, not 3 and 1, but 1 and 1 and 1 and 2. We'll start with 1 and 2 today. And I will hide this one for right now. And we'll just keep one screen on and then we may need two later. But uh, hang on just a second. Let me do this and come up just a little bit. We're grateful for everybody that's here and um, we'll have a time to welcome you here at the end and uh, we're gonna take questions, a few questions today. You need to be taking notes. Uh, we're gonna be uh, probably doing a little review quiz next week sometimes, but um, this is um, the chaotic earth part two. We're gonna be dealing with Satan's rebellion which led to the flood and we may get to the flood today. We may cover a lot of ground here, so hopefully we can. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Of course, we've told you that there is, this is the dateless past right here. We do not know when this event occurred right here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, heavens. It's, it's translated heavens in some translations, which I don't think it's it misses the meaning because there are heavens. Paul talked about three heavens, this heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven. And uh, God himself um, is not, he's confined to, he's not confined to anywhere. God, God's God, the Holy Spirit goes throughout this earth. And um, so heavens would not be a bad translation of that. But this, for the Bible, the King James writer says heaven created the heaven and the earth. And then, as I've told you over and over the last several weeks when we were talking with creation, there was something that took place between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2. The Genesis 1 and 1 was the anti-chaotic age. That was the age of the original perfect earth. And the dateless past was God. You've got two things working. Let me go back to that first verse just to remind you and refresh in your memory. When it says right here, in the beginning, God, this is the dateless past. God had no beginning. And he had no ending, or has no ending. And uh, let me get the wrong, I've got the wrong whiteboard here. Right here, uh, in the beginning, God, that is the dateless past. And, uh, hang on just a second, let me do this. Uh, why is it not doing that? Ah, there we go. All right, now, in the beginning, God, uh, what is going on this morning? Give me a minute, my whiteboard ain't working. What's well, a teacher without a whiteboard, right? There we go. Now that should do it. Yep. Nope. That's not going to do it either. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just start another one. We can do that. Let me come back over here. There we can right click it. And that should work now. In the beginning, God, right there. This is the dateless past because God had no beginning. It doesn't say God started in the beginning. No, He is the beginning. Everything begins with God. He was never, he's, he was always here. Christ was always here. The Holy Spirit was always here. That is the dateless past. You want to write that in your notes. That's number one. That's an age to itself, the dateless past. It's where he created the angels. He created Lucifer. He created the heavens. He created the earth. This original heaven and original earth is point number two. That is the original perfect earth. That is the original perfect earth. There's no time frame on this. We don't know when this occurred. We talked about this yesterday. There were people on here. There were angels on this earth. 
there were creatures on this earth, animals, plants, life, things like that. And then today, what we're talking about and what we're dealing with over the last couple of days is really the third part of this uh, dateless past. Let me see if I can get this to work. It never worked. I got to turn the whiteboard off for it to work. There we go. This right here is actually the third leg of this because this right here, the earth became or earth was, hang on just a second. Wants, the whiteboard wants to be ornery this morning. Um, the earth was without form and void. Um, hang on. The earth was without form and void. And we talked about a word yesterday. And I'm going to see if somebody remembered that word. What was the word? What was the word that we used yesterday that means without form and void? What's the word there? Somebody want to put it in their chat room to see if you were listening yesterday? There you go. Sandy's quick. Tuho, T-O-H-U, W-A-B-O-H-U. It's a, There we go. Carol's got the full thing. It's B-O-H-U. Very good. Very good. Very good. People were listening. Yes. Jimenez, good sob. M-O-M, 19, Joanna. Good. Susan Turner. And that word means without form and void. And today, we're going to look at another word that has to do with this word right here because this word right here tricks a lot of people up and that's this word was and we're going to talk about how this really should have been translated by the King James writer it became it became this is became okay I'm having to write with my mouse that's why uh, <laughs> it looks so funny there but this word right here is important because the earth was not created like this. It became like this. It became like this in Genesis 1 and 2. And we're going to talk about why today. But again, let me just say it again, just to refresh your memory and just to help you folks understand the creation. If you can understand this, this is your dateless past right here. There's no beginning for God. And by the way, let me come back over here and say this because I need to say this because there are some people that wrongly believe this. Some wrongly believe Christ was created. God didn't create Christ. He was begotten. He was begotten of Mary. He came in the flesh. Christ was with God from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Trinity has always been here. The Holy Spirit's always been here. God's always been here. Christ has always been here. Agnostics and a lot of this Gnosticism teaching and a lot of this false teaching, the Mormons, the Mormons, and... I'm going to deal with them today. I got an interesting thing I found. I want to thank Cleo for researching this out for me about angels, how many cults and movements got started with people claiming they were seeing angels because we're going to talk about angels today. But do not forget that. You need to write that in your notes. Jesus Christ was not created. Write that down. He was not created. He was begotten. He was begotten as God's only son in the flesh. God sent his son in the form of sinful flesh, that he might redeem man, the sin, the sinfulness of man, he would redeem man from his sinfulness. He came in sinless flesh. I want to say it again this morning, and I'm not even going to remotely go there, but I want to make just a passing remark, one sentence about it. This doctrine that we dealt with last week, folks, that's why we were, that's why I was dealing with it. It was not to draw swords with anybody, even though a lot of the other folks drew swords with us. But it, it's an attack on that sinless flesh of Christ. And that's why it's so important that you reject that doctrine. And you reject the truth of that. There's no truth in that. There's, it's absolutely fallacy. It's fable. But it's dangerous because it, it attacks subtly. And what is the devil? He's subtle. What's the enemy? He's subtle. He used a serpent that was the most subtle of creatures. Satan is the same way. The serpent and Satan, while not the same, their characteristics are. You can always hear the hissing of it. It's evil. And Satan subtly attacks the sinless perfection of Christ, folks, because if he can destroy that thinking that Christ was sinless, then he can do other things and make people believe that Christ ain't even the Son of God anymore. And he's not the sinless son of God. 
And that is why that doctrine is so dangerous. And that is why you need to reject it outright. It became, the world became that way because of rebellion. All right, now, let me go back because I don't want to get bogged down here today. I got to move, got to move. Number two, again, just helping you remember this. And this is why I'm teaching. I'm doing it as a teaching this morning. Not so much preaching it, but teaching it. Heavens and the earth. This was the second. This is the original perfect earth right here. This is the second outline, part of our outline. This was our first outline. This was our second. And then today, and what we've been talking about yesterday, is really number three. Because something happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Now, let's go back to our outline. Let's go back to our outline. That original earth of Genesis 1 and 1. There were mountains and hills there. There were fruitful places and gardens there. There were cities there. There were birds, animals, possibly dinosaurs. And uh, a lot of people say, well, how in the world did man live with the dinosaurs as evil and wicked as those creatures were? Folks, the movies, the movies don't believe Jurassic Park, okay? Uh, some people base their gospel on Jurassic Park, and they base their gospel on these other movies where the big, big Tyrannosaurus Rexes run around, eat people, and all that stuff. These dinosaurs, folks, before the sin and rebellion, all creatures were docile. And to be honest with you, even in the Garden of Eden, when God created the mammals and he recreated the creation, all of those animals, folks, were docile. They were not, they were not meat eaters. They were not ferocious animals. Somebody want to tell me what caused that? Can somebody, would, would somebody like to talk about why that those animals uh, became the way they came. Why can't a lion lay down with the lamb right now? Would somebody want to take a guess why that's taking place? What happened? What happened to creation? There you go, Georgia. Georgia gets the award to be first. There we go. It ain't Lucifer, Joanna. No, it, Lucifer didn't cause that. Sin caused that. Rebellion and sin, Carol. Absolutely. Sin came into this earth and caused the creation to fall. Satan didn't cause those animals to get angry. No, it wasn't Satan. It was sin. It was man's failure. It was his rebellion. Just like it was Lucifer's rebellion that led to the destruction of the first earth. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning because I want to get into this. Let me go back to my outline before I get started because I'll get off topic and we'll get all messed up here. So let me go back. There were animals on that creation, possibly dinosaurs, but whatever animals they were, it was in a perfect state, and they were not created to be these carnivorous, dangerous, man-eating, ugly creatures that you see today. And sin caused that. There were men who lived in these cities. These cities were broken down. All vegetation, all animals were totally destroyed in this first flood, in this first judgment by the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. The earth had become, and all of you got this right, Toho, T-O-H-U, W-A-B-O-H-U. It's the same word that we showed you side by side yesterday that's in Genesis 1 and 2. That is in Jeremiah 4.23. This is taken from Jeremiah 4.23. The angels were hiding their light. This judgment caused a mist to come up. And this judgment was caused by the rebellion of Lucifer. It was caused by the rebellion of of Lucifer. Let me give you a few facts about this rebellion. Isaiah and Ezekiel give insight to Lucifer's original character and rebellion. We sort of briefly touched on this about two weeks ago, and we're going to deal with it more today. We'll get done what we can today, and then when we pick it up next week in our next Bible study, we'll continue this and have long it takes. I'm not in any hurry. Um, Isaiah and Ezekiel give insight to Lucifer's original character and rebellion. Lucifer coveted the glory and power that belonged only to God. He has instilled that in man today. That is why man's like he is to a degree, because Lucifer has put that idea in man's head that he should glory and covet the glory and power that only belongs to God, the deification of man. Because of pride, he led a rebellion against God and suffered the judgment of God. Isaiah, we're going to read this in a minute, stated that Lucifer weakened the nations of the earth. Not only did Lucifer persuade one-third of the angelic host to rebel with him, but he convinced the inhabitants of the original perfect earth, the cities of men that Jeremiah saw, and the nations that Isaiah described to join his forces. I want to look at those verses right quick. 
I want to look at that. Um, John, the Revelator, and we're going to be studying this on Wednesday night in Revelation. I, I don't want to get bogged down in it. But John actually was given a little insight to the pre-Adamic earth during the time that he was on Patmos. And I'm sure John had had this revelation before. Peter wrote about it. John, I'm sure, was aware of it. But the Lord showed him a vision. And in this vision, there was a dragon that was going after um, the woman, the man-child of Revelation 12 is not the church. The, the man-child of Revelation 12 are the 144,000 Jews. And in this vision, he saw this dragon, and he saw this vision in Revelation 12 and 4, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Let me tell you something that's interesting about this verse right here, folks. John wrote this nearly 6,000, 2,000 years ago, I should say. He wrote this 2,000 years ago. But this right here is something that he basically draws about the dateless past. We do not know when this took place. This right here, the dragon has been standing before the woman forever. And if you understand Bible prophecy, and I don't want to get bogged down in this because it's a separate study, but this is where we know that Satan took a third part of the stars, the stars, that is referring to angelic creatures, the, the sons of the morning, the angels. Um, rejoice, Job 38. Um, let me do this. Now's a good time to probably put these things side by side. Hang on just a second. Let me... Uh, let me uh, come in here and do this for you. Uh, hang on just a second. Uh, there we go. Now, let me come back over here. And um, let me bring this over here. I want you to look at this verse right here. God's talking about the original creation. And then he tells Job this right here. When the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. God created the stars. But in this case, in Revelation 12 and 4, John is referring to the angelic host. He's referring to the angelic host. Now, Isaiah talks about... Hang on just a second. Sorry about this, folks. I'm having to do this by myself. It's, I don't have a producer, so I have to do this like this. In 1412, Isaiah starts prophesying about that fall. Jesus, let me just read this verse to you, Luke 10, 18. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Isaiah had already prophesied this. He said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That's an important term, by the way, folks. Let me, let me explain that right there to you. Let me lock this into position. Let me, let me tell you something about this statement right there. Son of the morning, I'll just highlight it. There's a lot of people that have wrongly proclaimed, and I don't know what group it is, the Mormons or somebody that has claimed that Satan and Christ are the same because Satan was called the son of the morning and Christ was called the morning star. That's not the same title. The sun of the morning and the bright and the morning star are not the same. Christ and the devil are not the same. Christ is the bright and the morning star. Satan, or Lucifer, was called the sun of the morning. And Isaiah tells him, he says, How art thou cut down which did weaken the nations? The nations. And I go back to Jeremiah 4 and 23. We know that there were nations on this earth. So, not only did he lead the angelic host against God, but he led these men, these inhabitants of the perfect earth, the cities of men that Jeremiah saw, and the nations that Isaiah described to join his forces. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Let me come back over to my screen. Some of you have asked this question. You've asked this question before, and uh, I want to say it again. I want to ask you this about the end of time. Satan never changes his game plan. Uh, let me remind you that at the end of the millennial, Satan did this at the very beginning, and Satan's going to do this very thing 
at the very end. He led a rebellion against God right after he was created as Lucifer. At the end of the thousand year millennial, he will be bound a thousand years. He will be at the at the beginning of it, he will be bound and chained in the bottomless pit for one thousand years. At the end of the millennial, he will be loosed for a season upon the earth. And when he is loosed upon the earth, he will go throughout the nations again. There will be nations in the millennium. They will come to worship Jerusalem. We'll probably be one landmass. I, I, I believe that. My dad's always believed that, and I do too, that the cataclysmic judgments of the tribulation are, is going to bring the earth back into one landmass, but there will still be nations on the earth during the millennium. And guess what? Some of you, if you're faithful in a little, will be made ruler over much. It's very possible that some of you, if not all of you, if you're child, children of God, and you're part of the church, you're going to rule and reign with Christ, and you may even rule some of those nations in government. And it will be a theocracy. It will not be a democracy. It will be a theocracy. But at the end of this millennial, Satan will do the exact same thing again. He will go through the earth, and guess what he will try to do? He'll try to lead a rebellion. He won't have angels. I don't know if there'll be angels during that time that he can lead, but he'll definitely, definitely lead the nations. And that would indicate that there still may be demon spirits on the earth to a degree, but they will be being eradicated by Christ during that millennial. But for however Satan can do it, he's going to deceive the nations, and they're going to lead one final rebellion against God. It is at that time that God, the second time, where he destroyed the first time by a flood, the second time that Satan does this at the end, the earth will not be destroyed by a flood, it will be destroyed by fire. Because God will rain fire down from heaven, and they will literally be swallowed up. And you say, how do I know that, McDonald? How, are you, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you prove that? Well, it's called the B-I-B-L-E. So let's go to the B-I-B-L-E and let me show you that. Let me show you that right now so you can see that I'm not making this up and this is not some fairy tale like some folks like to push out there. Let me, let me just go ahead and give this to you straight from the Bible so you'll know that this is going to happen. And I can tell you that it's, it's not a good thing. It says this, I saw thrones that set upon them and judgment was given to them and that were beheaded for the witness which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, or in his hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. It talks about being blessed and holy. That's part of the first resurrection. Second death hath no power. There shall be priest of God, reign with him a thousand years. And I want you to look at this verse right here, Revelation 20 and 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. That's Satan, folks, right there. Satan's going to do this. Do you understand? Satan is going to do this. Not, not, uh, hang on just a second. I'm having the worst time this morning with my chalkboard. <clears throat> hang on just a second. Let me. Delete it again. Let me try this one more time. Sorry about this. The devil don't want me to highlight this, but I'm going to highlight it. Right there. He's going to deceive the nations. I want you to look at that last line, folks. The number of whom is the sand of the sea. Let me come back over here. There's a Bible lesson in that, and you've heard me say it often. Um, man's had a thousand years at this point without Satan. Okay? Man has had a thousand years up to that point. Satan has not been allowed to tempt man anymore. Okay? He's loose for a season. Loose just for a season. He goes out. He does the very thing at the very end of time or end of the millennial that he did at the very beginning of time. At least the same kind of rebellion against God. He is able to deceive the nations in such a way. Think about this, folks. That John saw a number that is as the sand of the sea. Now, don't get caught up on Gog and Magog. I'll explain all that when we get to Revelation. That just 
That's just the term God uses for this rebellion. That's not Russia. It's not the same Gog and Magog of Armageddon. It's not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is already in the lake of fire. And look what happens to old Satan. Let me tell you what his doom is. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven. And fire came down from heaven, from God, out of heaven, and devoured them. That's going to be the doom of all rebellion at the end. All rebellion, that will be the final rebellion on planet earth. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. No wonder he don't want me to highlight this this morning. Let, let me read that again. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, folks, where the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. The beast is already there. The false prophet had been there for a thousand years and shall be tormented day and night. And let me underline that term right there. Forever and forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And if I circled that 25 times, it a million times, it wouldn't be any different. Folks, hell is an eternal place. The lake of fire is an eternal place. That is what's going to happen at the end. But I want you to notice the fact that it's the same kind of rebellion that he led at the beginning against God that led to the destruction of the first earth. And then it is at this point that the final judgment of all sin takes place at the great white throne judgment. And I don't want to get into that this morning. We'll talk about that at the appropriate time. But Lucifer was able to persuade a third of the angelic host to rebel with him and the cities of men and all the nations that Jeremiah described and Isaiah described in Isaiah 14 and 12. The angels mentioned in Revelation 12 and 4 and the inhabitants of the original perfect earth sided with Lucifer against Almighty God. Folks, I want you to think about that a minute. It's the same thing with the millennial thing. I, I want you to just think about this because there's a reason why I'm about to say this. I want to, I want to make a point about this this morning. You need to write this down. When God created that original perfect earth, there was no sin in it. There was no corruption. It was a perfect Garden of Eden, just like the Garden of Eden we read about in Genesis 1. 1 and 3 on. There was a Garden of Eden because Ezekiel is going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that verse in a minute if we get to that verse today about Satan and Lucifer. Man had perfect conditions. Lucifer was created perfect. There was nothing that man wanted or needed on that earth. Man was in a perfect utopia paradise. But those inhabitants of the earth Evidently, all of them did, folks, because God did not spare one single inhabitant of that planet. There was no life left. I want you to let that sink in, too. Satan just didn't get a third of the angels. He evidently got that entire creation to throw their lot in with him and rebel against God. Let that sink in. Because there was no, none of that original creation was left. None of it. Now, people like Ken Ham reject this. They, they think, oh, this is just poppycock. I heard him say that one night in one of his creation conferences. And I like Ken. This is not a slap at him, but it's not poppycock, folks. It's right here out of the Word of God. It is ironic to me that both rebellions are the same. He tried to do it at the beginning. He's going to do it at the end. That should tell you how, um, how much uh, Satan does not change his ways. He's been the same deceiver from the beginning. He's the same deceiver at the end. He does the same thing. Man is his pawn. Because he knows God loves man and he just feels like if he can destroy man and damage man, he damages God. And in a way he is because it hurts God to see man in the condition he's in. But he knows the source of man's rebellion. It's not just Satan, it's man's heart. But something was in those original people, those at original creation that evidently they saw this conflict and they said, you know, we're tired of this perfect. We want, we want to throw our lot in with Satan. I don't know how he did it. The Bible don't tell us. There was no mercy shown to that original earth. God destroyed the whole thing. Everything. He destroyed the plant life. He destroyed the inhabitants. The animals. Everything. Cast Lucifer out of heaven. He was cast out. He wasn't, he wasn't chained in that instant. 
Fast forward this. This is the point I'm trying to make about this. Fast forward this. The millennial, again, Satan's out of the way. Man's got Satan no more. Satan, no, man does not have Satan to blame anymore for his problems. And that's what man does today. That's what the church does. Look, you got conferences going on in my state tomorrow going to try to convince people that the only evil in the earth is going on in Davos, Switzerland today. And the only evil people are the reset people. And I'll, I, folks, I'm, I'm telling you that that is the mentality of the modern church. That's what they're trying to convince people, that that's the only evil on the earth. No, the evil on the earth is staring you in that mirror. I'm going to just be blind and get about that again. The evil on the earth is staring you in that mirror. It's called the heart of man. I know that people don't want to hear that because it, it just, it just, it totally tears away their theology. It tears away their, their little play party. It tears away, it would tear away most YouTube channels. Most people would stop watching about 99% of the crap on YouTube if they understood that concept. They'd stop watching 99% of the stuff on Telegram. They'd stop listening to 99% of this mess if they understood that fact, which most don't. But it stares us right in the face. During that millennial, folks, you've got, you got a perfect condition. There, look, it's not going to be 100% perfect because there will still be death during the millennial. It will be a theocracy, and there evidently will be pockets of rebellion that will raise their head because the earth is not going to, uh, let me put it like this. There ain't going to be no, if the glove don't fit, if the glove don't fit, you got to acquit. There ain't going to be none of that kind of justice during the millennium. There ain't going to be none of this OJ getting away with murder stuff. There ain't going to be any of this mess about the, the elections being, um, as Ricky Wilson said, uh, creatively changed. And I'll just leave it at that because I don't want my channel yank for saying that. There, there's not going to be any corruption in our processes because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to be ruling from Jerusalem. By the way, he's not going to be ruling from Washington, D.C. He, The United States is not the promised land QAnon folks. I need to remind some Bible people, some people that claim they're Christians about that because you've got idiots out there believing that imbecilic stuff. Now, he's not coming back to the good old U.S. of A. He's coming back to set his kingdom up in the good old Jerusalem, in Israel. And he's going to rule this earth. It will be a theocracy. If there is rebellion, you, the child of God, we will be in power over this earth. That's what I talked about last night. It has always been God's intention to carve out this body for the church because we are destined to rule with him, folks. And that's one of the reasons, and, and again, I'm, not, I'm getting off my topic a little bit, but this is good fodder for you. This is good food that you can take with you today to think about. It's one of the reasons why Paul and 1 Corinthians 6 rebuked the Corinthians for suing each other. He said, why do you go to law with each other? Why do you sue each other? Do you not know that one day you're going to rule angels? He told the church that. He told that church at Corinth that. With all these divisions, with all this carnality, with all this fighting, with all this infighting. He said, for God's sake, he said, one day you are going to rule over this earth. You're going to be over this earth, ruling over angels, ruling over nations. Let me go back to that Bible verse, folks. Let me tell you something. I've always believed this right here. Let me go back to uh, Revelation 20 and 4. Some of you didn't catch what that verse said, and I'm going to bring it to your attention because it's very important that you see it. I saw thrones. I saw thrones. I saw thrones, folks. John saw thrones. And that they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. Who is them this morning? Who is them? Where's judgment going to be given, folks? Let me tell you where that judgment. Let me tell you who that's talking about. It's talking about you, child of God. That is what the church is destined to do. We are destined to be the government over the earth during the millennium. We're not destined to do that right now. I know there's a lot of movements that are trying it. There's a lot of people that are bringing this seven mountain theology fallacy into the play. And this kingdom now, that we got to establish the kingdom now before Christ. You cannot establish that throne without Christ. Christ is on the earth. When John saw that, it was after the physical second coming of Christ. The government of God cannot be established on this earth without God here. And you say, well, that's, I don't believe that. Well, you don't have to believe that. That's what the Bible says, though. 
The Bible says that John saw thrones and it was given to them judgment, folks. He saw that after the second coming of Christ. He did not see that before. You and I are going to rule this earth as being the church. We're the body of Christ. We are His body. We will rule and reign with Him. He talks about that in Romans 8, that these sufferings, know that these sufferings are just a mere, a mere blip on the radar that you're going through this morning compared to the glory that you're going to be experiencing with Him. And that with Him we're going to rule and we're going to reign together in that millennial. That's beautiful. That's why Satan tries to instill this false government in the church today because he's trying to thwart that coming government on the earth in the millennium. And he deceives man into thinking that man can rule without God. Because, folks, that's at the heart of this false doctrine. Man wants to rule the earth without God, and the church wants to rule the earth without God. It's some deep stuff, folks. I hope you're catching it this morning. Both rebellions were the same. The first one and the last one. Both were done during a time of perfection on the earth. You had an original perfect earth then. You had a millennial kingdom after the thousand years there where there was no Satan. There was no, look, sin will be put down. Rebellion will be put down. You won't be picking up your paper and reading about knifings and rapes and murders and thefts and bombings and terrorist attacks and things like that. If they do occur, the people that do them, they're not going to be hauled off the court. They will be executed on the spot. There will be true justice on this earth during the millennia. It, it will not be like you see today. And you, child of God, are going to be in charge of that. <clears throat> Those that are faithful and that are determined. I'm going to go back to that verse. And I think another thing that you can read into this, it's very possible, folks, those thrones, those thrones right there, I've talked to my brother about this. We've had a lot of discussions, and, I, and I'm not going to disagree with what he's got to say about that. He believes that there, that's a possibility that some of you may be put over the earth as intercessors and be given thrones because we sit with Christ. What does Ephesians tell us where we sit with Christ sometimes? We sit with Christ in heavenly places. Folks, when you're interceding, do you realize your prayers are going to the heavenly places around the earth? We're going to talk about angels in the next few days and weeks. Man, this is some good stuff this morning. I hope you're catching some of this. But it's very possible that you're going to be sitting on those thrones in the heavenlies. That the child of God, where you, if you're not ruling the earth from the earth, you may very well be sitting on a throne over the earth, praying and interceding. Praying and interceding for righteousness. For righteousness. For righteousness. Where the devil and his forces are over the earth trying to bring destruction during the millennial. During the millennial, the children of God are going to inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You're going to inherit the earth, child of God. We're going to inherit the earth. We're going to have the king of kings as our king and as our Lord. He's going to be ruling from Jerusalem. But he is going to be working through his body on this earth, the body of Christ, you, the church, are going to be the government on this earth then. Not before then, but that is when it's going to happen. That's when you're going to see true justice. That is when you're going to see everything that all these people are trying to, to quicken today that's not going to happen until Christ comes back. But let me go back to my original point. I'm going to start getting on that and I'm going to Get off topic. I can shout and scream with all of you like you do. And I see you out there. And I know it's, it's, it's touching your heart like it's touching mine. I feel it. But those thrones are given to us. For judgment. For judgment. For righteous judgment on this earth. And righteous judgment in the heavenlies. But think about this, folks. Think about this again. you got a thousand years of peace. A thousand years where they will learn war no more. The lamb will lay down with the lion. The serpent, you can have a, a baby hold a snake during the millennial. The snake's not going to bite it no more. The, the, the sin nature, the power of sin will be broken by Christ. He will defeat death. The death is the final enemy that he will defeat during the millennial. Man has a thousand years of this. The gospel Millions, billions will come into the kingdom of God. 
You hear about all these visions about a billion people coming into the kingdom. Folks, during that millennial, I do not doubt that it will not be millions, but billions of people will be saved during the millennial. The gospel will be freely able to flow without hindrance. You and some of you, and that's why your calling is important. Some of you are called to preach, called to teach, called to sing, called to evangelize, called to an apostleship, called to prophesy. I firmly believe that those that are in the fivefold ministry gift, they're going to be doing this in earnest and in full during the millennial. Yes, there'll probably be churches in, in the world because we will be worshiping the Lamb. I don't know how all this is going to look, but I know it's going to be glorious. But as I sit here and think about this this morning, man has a thousand years of glorious without the hindrance of Satan. And God in his mystery. And let me just give you a little Bible lesson this morning because I know people ask this question sometimes. They say, well, Chris, why does God do this? Why does God not just destroy Satan at the... Why didn't he destroy Satan at the beginning? Why did he allow him latitude like he's allowed all of these years? Why has he done this? Why has God allowed Satan to um, roam the earth, deceive millions, send people to hell by the deception that he puts them in? And t attaching himself to the fallen nature of man. Deceiving man. Why does God do that? It's something called the mystery of God. And I want to read that to you this morning in the same passage in Revelation. Because if you can understand this, you can sort of understand why things are like they are. John talks about this in Revelation 10 and 7. It says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God... The mystery of God. And we're going to talk about that in detail. We may even have a Sunday morning program. We may have a, a, a church service on this very thing and talk about this. Should be finished. Should be finished. As he has declared to his servants, the prophets. He's speaking of the Old Testament prophets. And he's really speaking of us too. He's speaking of the church. He's speaking to all those that proclaim his word. What is the mystery of God? What is the mystery of God this morning? And I'll tell you what the mystery of God is. It's why would God not destroy Satan along with the inhabitants of that first earth? Why would God, instead of when Christ comes back the second time physically, instead of just throwing him in a bottomless pit for a thousand years, loose him again to lead another rebellion where John saw a number that he could not even number, the sands of the sea. Why? It's the mystery of God. But it's going to be answered when it is finished. It will be finished at the end of the millennium. It will finally be finished. And all questions will be settled. And let me tell you what question is going to be settled to man. This is where I was going with all of this. Man rebelled against God the first time in a perfect condition. Adam and Eve rebelled against God in perfect conditions. And the human race at the end of the millennial in perfect conditions is going to rebel against God again. What's the moral of that story? The monster that is out there is not the monsters at Davos and not the monsters in the deep state and not the monsters that this cheer is trying to convince you, the Great Reset folks, that there's five of them and then there's like a hundred in that other crowd that's supposed to be the good guys. I would argue that the monster is in that crowd too. No, the monster is right here, folks. The monster is right here in your heart. Jesus Christ came to set man free from sin and self. Yourself, folks, the self of man is far more dangerous than even sin. It is self, self-will, self-rebellion. That's what Satan raised himself up in, in self-rebellion. And let me tell you what's the greatest danger to you as a child of God. is not just self-will, but it's self-help. I hear this uh, statement sometimes, God helps those that help themselves. You can't help yourself. If you could help yourself, Christ would not have had to come to die for your sins and to deliver you from self. But the moral of this story this morning, the moral of this teaching is this. In perfect conditions, Satan led a rebellion. The first time, man followed him. In perfect conditions, you had two people, Adam and Eve. And God simply tells them a simple instruction. You can have 
any tree you want, there's just one you cannot touch or eat. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. He said you can't eat of it. And Satan enters into the foray, deceives man. Man throws his lot in with Satan again. At the end of the millennial, after God gives man perfect conditions for a thousand years. By the way, Adam and Eve didn't have to work that garden. When, when he put Adam and Eve there, it says they were put there to till the garden. Adam didn't break a sweat doing it, folks. Those conditions, those animals, everything that was in that garden was perfect. It was beautiful. Adam didn't have to break a sweat. Him and Eve, uh, when God brought Eve out of his rib, let's just say that things were hot at the house. Everything was perfect. I mean, I'm being very facetious a little bit, but I'm being very serious, folks. They had a good union. Everything was fruitful. Everything they touched was fruitful. Look, Adam had creative power. I don't doubt that. Look, his intelligence level was off the chart. Man was not the distorted creature that you see today. Man, Adam had such intelligence. I tell you how much intelligence he had, folks. God brought these animals to Adam, and he said, name this animal. And whatever name that Adam named that animal, God let that animal have that name. That came from a created being of God in his perfect state. In a, in a perfect state where you didn't have to sweat. And if Eve would have had Cain and Abel before the fall, she would have had no pain whatsoever. I know you ladies would have loved that, to have had children without pain. Everything changed with that sin. And man and the creation went down the toilet after that. The millennial, Christ is correcting what's happened in the Garden of Eden under Adam and Eve. He cleanses the earth of rebellion over that thousand years. Universal prosperity. You won't have poverty in the millennial. Universal gospel, universal peace, you know, everything, folks. It will be a reversing of what Satan took from man. God will give back to man during the millennial. And at the end of the millennial, after God's done all of that, guess what? Satan's going to be loose for a season. And guess what man does? Again, he throws his lot in with the devil. That should tell you who the monster is, folks. Now, the, the modern church does not want to hear that message. Because it's easier for the church to separate evil from good by separating groups over here and saying, well, this group's evil, and the rest of us white hats over here are good folks. We're moral folks. And, and I hear this all the time. This is the great conflict on the earth at the last days. The white hats versus the black hats. You heard that? You heard that? That comes from the QAnon. That comes from the QAnon folks. That comes from the QAnon folks. We got to rid the earth of the black hats. The black hats are in control. The white hats are in control. No. Man's heart is black, folks. Man's heart is black. Man's heart is black. And every time that man has been given a chance, every time man has been given a chance to do right, he's thrown his lot in with Satan. He's done it every time. And he will do it every time, even at the very end, folks. Think about this. I hope you're catching this. I hope you go home today after this Bible study, and I want you to Think hard about what you've heard this morning. Think hard about it. Because this is what led to the destruction of that first earth. And all of those inhabitants, not just a few, but all of them, threw their lot in with Lucifer. He, they threw their lot in with him in this rebellion because of pride, because of covetousness of God's glory, because of covetousness of God's power. He wanted it, and he convinced a third of the angels, and he convinced the entire inhabitants of the earth to throw their lot in with him. And let's just be frank with you, John just didn't see a few following him at the end of the millennial, folks. He saw a number that was as the sand of the sea. And I believe when I read that verse right there, and I've read this many times through the years, the mystery of God. I've always believed that the mystery of God, and we'll talk about this in detail, is the fact that he wants man to see the fact that man is evil and it doesn't matter what external forces are influencing man man has an evil heart and God has been trying to scream that at man for probably thousands, tens of thousands, millions perhaps of years 
and man does not get it. And sadly, most of his preachers don't get it. And sadly, most of you listening to me don't get it. If you got it, you wouldn't be wasting your hours and your money and your time and precious hours that you could be spreading the gospel to others and doing things for the kingdom of God to get this harvest in, wasting your time on videos, trying to convince yourself that we need to be worried about the boogeyman out there. Folks, I'll say it again this morning that I said it last night. Let me tell you something. Klaus Schwab does not scare me. I don't care what's going on in that economic forum. I've been watching Twitter and Instagram this morning. Everybody's saying, you need to watch what's going on over there. You need to watch what's going on over there. You need to watch what's going on over there. Folks, there ain't a thing that's going on over there that's going to alter the course of this book. It's actually being what they're doing is playing into this book. Everything that they're doing, folks, has been prophesied by prophets. I just read you the verse. This mystery of God was prophesied. He declared this to his prophets. These things have been prophesied of old. These things have been prophesied by Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, John, Paul. It's part of the narrative of the end times. If people would read their Bibles, of course, that's the big thing. We don't read our Bibles, so we get caught up in this nonsense, dumb, foolery stuff. Because we would rather listen to a YouTube idiot for an hour than spend about that same hour reading what God's Word has to say about the future. It's all right here, folks. It's all right here. Just stick with me on Wednesday night. You'll see. You'll see. Stick with me here. You'll see. None of that which is going on this morning is going to alter the course of that. They don't even realize it. They may realize it some. But they are being played like a tool by the same devil that led that rebellion at the beginning. The same devil that led the rebellion in the Garden of Eden. The same devil that will lead the rebellion at the end of the millennial. And I will tell you that we're all in the same, folks. Man will be destroyed that rebels against God. He will find himself in the same lake of fire. And the same hell that Satan will find himself in at the very end of the millennial. Where the false prophet and the beast will be found there as well forever. And forever. And forever. And forever. All three times... Man did this in perfect conditions, and man failed. And that, to me, is, I believe, what the mystery of God is. That he's literally saying that you think that it's the devil's fault. It's not. I want to read you another verse this morning. Sort of off topic, but this is good stuff. So I'm just going to go with the flow. Let me read you another verse this morning. That is an interesting verse. Some of you have read this before. Some of you haven't. But it's a very important verse. And one of the scariest verses of the Bible to me, if I can get this right here, right here, Revelation 9 and 20. Folks, this is in the middle. If you're reading Revelation 9, I'll, I'll just go back and read. I'll just go back and read the power, uh, the verses before that. It talks about a third of the men were killed. A third of the men were killed. Judgments are falling all over the earth, folks. Judgment. Is falling all over the earth by fire, by the smoke and the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. That's actually speaking of that demon horde that John saw, that John saw in Revelation 9. But I want you to look at what happens after all of this judgment. I want you to look at what happens to man. And it's interesting that John puts this a few verses before he mentions the mystery of God. And the rest of the men. <clears throat> which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not, repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither see, hear, or talk, neither repented them of their murders, Sorceries, that's drug addiction, by the way, by the way, their fornication, nor of their thefts. Neither repented they. After all this judgment, folks, folks, listen to me. Man refuses to repent in perfect conditions. Man refuses to repent in judgment. Let that sink in this morning. That's your Bible lesson for today on this study in God's Word on this 19th day of January. That's the message of the chaotic earth to us, screaming at us this morning. 
Man don't repent during perfect times. Man doesn't repent during times of judgment. Even when all the judgments are falling from the heavens, stars falling, wormwood, demon hordes on the earth, locusts, men screaming to die, and they can't die during the tribulation because of the pain that these things are going to cause. Fire and brimstone proceeding out of their mouth. Famine, war, death and hell following the Antichrist. Basically being told, you either take a mark that you either can't sell, eat, or buy. And if you don't, you're going to have your head cut off. And if you do take that mark, you're eternally damned for hell to ever. In the midst of all that, doesn't get man's attention. Man's just numb to it. Don't repent. Let that sink in. Let that sink in this morning. Let that sink in this morning. So, if man won't repent... If man won't repent, if man won't repent from perfect conditions and he won't repent in judgment, that should tell you that the problem, folks, is not Davos, Switzerland. The problem is not the deep state. The problem is not the elites. The problem is not the boogeyman and the Great Reset. The problem is not Barack Obama. Problem is not George Soros. Problem is not the Chinese coca cut, coconut cake. The problem is not anything, folks. The problem is staring you right in the mirror. The problem is the heart of man. It is the hearts of men. 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 I feel like I need to bring it to an end right there today and pick this up tomorrow. I'm going to go back to my outline. I want to read one other verse to you this morning. Did you get something out of this today? Let me read this to you right here. Those, those uh, Pharisees were asking Christ, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth a man cannot defile him by the way folks you should understand that truth this morning you've got people trying to convince you that we're to be legalists about what we eat that these things defile us it's not what goes into you that defiles you I want to say that again this morning I know some of you don't want to hear that because again it just upsets your legalism apple cart and Christ asks are you without understanding many are Many are. Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him. It cannot defile him. You know why? And some of you are going to, if you're Amish in the room, you might want to leave. This might be a little tough for some of our Amish friends to handle. And I shouldn't say that about the Amish. But for our wheezy fit friends that are so scared of their shadow, because it entereth not into his heart. Because what enters from a man does not enter into his heart. It enters into his belly. And goeth out in the drought. Let me just talk about that to you in South Georgia. Mac Files language. That's number two, folks. You know what number two is. I don't have to tell you what number two is. If I do, please email me and I will explain that to you. And you say, that's being sarcastic. It's being very sarcastic, folks, because a lot of Christians walk around telling people that it's what goes into people that hurts them, and they, they literally make a, a religion out of it. The Pharisees did that. The Pharisees did that, and the Pharisees of today do the same thing. It goes right out, folks. Whatever comes in, you goes out. And I ain't got to tell you how. You understand number one and a number two. As Lawrence Welk would say, a number one and a number two. It goes out the drought, purging all meats. Purging all meats. And then he says it right here. It is that which cometh out of the man. That which comes out of the man, that defiles the man. That defiles the man. Not what goes in him, but what goes out of him. And what comes out of man? For from within... Out of the heart, out of the heart of men, 
Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, deceit, deceit, lasciviousness, which is lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness, thefts, covetousness, wickedness. Those things don't come from the deep state, folks. Those things don't come from the reset. Those things don't come from bloodlines. Those things don't come from generational curses. Those things don't come from the white hats or the black hats. Those things come out of the heart of men. The heart of men. The hearts of men. The hearts of men. I can't circle that enough. Let me do it again. The hearts of men. The heart of men. The hearts of men. The hearts of men. Let me make it clear to you folks that that heart is your heart. It's not your ancestor's heart. It's not your drunk grandfather's heart. It's your heart. And it's my heart that those things come out of. Now you ain't got to believe that. That is where rebellion comes. And that is why Satan was easily able to lead a rebellion in the original perfect earth. Men's hearts were evil. It's why Adam and Eve disobeyed God because they chose to disobey God and their heart chose to do that. It was their heart that chose to do that and they did it. And man's heart's been evil ever since. And at the end of the millennial, when men, again, in perfect conditions, are tempted by Satan to do it, it's because of evil hearts that they will throw their lot in with him. And in the middle of the tribulation, when judgment's falling, man's evil heart will, will cause him not to repent at all. So, you chew on that today. You, cho you chew on that today. You chew on that today. You chew on that today. And I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want to feed you too much and you get choked. I'll be back to pick this up tomorrow. Or maybe tomorrow, maybe next week because I'm not sure what our schedule is going to be tomorrow. But I want to go back to that outline real quick here. i got about 10 minutes. Lucifer wanted to ascend above the stars of God and ascend above the heights of the clouds. His throne represented the fact he already had rulership and authority. We'll talk about that authority next week. The destruction of the first earth is where many believe demon spirits have their origin. Now, at some point in the next few weeks, we're going to look at the difference between demons and fallen angels. And demons are to be distinguished between fallen angels. There are the disembodied spirits of that pre-Adamic world and race. We will talk about that in the weeks to come. But folks, this is the source of what happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 and where that earth became. That earth became null and void. And I'm going to look at that I didn't get a chance to do it today, but we're going to look at that word was and show you the Hebrew word for that and the difference in the two. All right. I think I've said my piece today. I think I've said my piece today. If you learned something today that you didn't know, put it in the chat room real quick. Put it in the chat room real quick today. If you learned something today you didn't know, you got about five minutes. I'm going to say goodbye. Anything today you learned you did not know, Cedric says, I've got a lot to mull over. I hope you do, Cedric. I hope everybody does. I hope everybody does. I truly do. I truly do. Um, I truly do. Nobody said anything in Facebook today. Ken's giving me the thumbs up. Janine's putting fire. Mom says, I'm learning something daily. Lisa says, I learned bunches. Angel says, I learned a lot. Amazing study. Sandy Sutherland, perfection is never good enough. No, it ain't, Sandy. Not when it comes to the heart of man. 
Susan said, I learned what we will be doing during the thousand year reign. We will be. We will be ruling and reigning with Christ. Jill said, I learned about the mystery of God. The mystery of God should be finished. Thousand year reign. Good deal. All right. Well, I've got a class that's learning, and that's all that matters, and that's why we do these Bible studies. So come on back next week. Come on back. Come on back next week. Come on back next week. We're going to learn some more. Come on back and learn some more. Um, Ron says, thought I could be with the 24 elders. Well, Ron, uh, we don't know who those 24 elders are. That's another teaching for another time, Ron. Carol Smith, maybe the pre-Adam race all destroyed because they wouldn't have repented. You know, Carol, that's a good question. I don't know. God, Whatever God saw, he destroyed them all. Satan got all of them to, to basically go in with his lot. That's all that, uh, that's all I can say. He went, he got them to go in with his lot. Now, whether they repented or not, I don't know. It's evidently they, it's evident they didn't, Carol, because there ain't no, uh, there ain't no, um, there ain't no earth, pre-Adamic earth left. Ron says, I never thought I could be with them. No, Ron, we're going to be around the throne in Revelation 4 and 5 when we're raptured out. We're headed to, we're, John saw what he saw in Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to be right there worshiping around them, that throne with those 24 elders. We're going to be worshiping with those 24 elders. I don't know who they are. We're going to talk about that when we get to Revelation. Don't have time to get into it this morning. All right. So I hope you took a lot of notes. Be studying this weekend because we're gonna we're gonna give you a quiz on this at some point to refresh your memory. Put some fire in that house for me this morning. Put some fire in that house for me this morning. Put some fire in that house, and we're grateful that you've been with us today. I'll see you at, at some point tonight, perhaps. We'll let you know on Facebook what our schedule is. No show tomorrow. Uh, but we will see you next week on the Bible study. We'll pick this up next week. And if, if things work out, I may be back in the morning, but it's more than likely next month, Monday or Tuesday. And we'll probably do three or four next week. So be with me then, okay? God bless you. God bless your families. God bless this great nation of America. Hope you enjoyed this today. A lot to think about, folks. I'm a soldier of the cross. And so are you this morning. Let the Lord touch you today. See ya. a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb. I shall not fear to own His cause, or bless to speak His word. Though the battle may be hard, and the conflict sore, rough and rocky the road, we're traveling on, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land. Sure I must fight, if I would reign, increase my courage, Lord, I'll bear the toil, endure the pain. Supported by thy word Though the battle may be hard And the conflict sore Rough and rocky the road We're traveling on Hold on a little longer Take Jesus by the hand He'll guide us safe To the glory land Though the battle may be hard and the conflict sore, rough and rocky the road, we're traveling on, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, he'll guide us safe to the glory land, hold on a little longer, take Jesus by the hand, 
He'll guide us safe to the glory land. Though the battle may be hard and the conflict sore, rough and rocky the road you're traveling on, hold on a little longer. Take Jesus by the hand. He'll guide us safe to the glory land. Hold on a little longer. Take Jesus by the hand. He'll guide us safe to the glory land. I am a pilgrim and a stranger. I'm traveling through this wearisome land. I've got a home in that yonder city. Good Lord, and it's not, Lord, will it's not. not made by hand. I've got a father, mother, and some brothers who have gone. This way before I am determined To go and see them Good Lord for there On that other shore I am a pilgrim And a stranger I'm traveling through This troublesome land But I've got a home In that yonder city Good Lord, and it's not, Good Lord, will it's not, not made by hand. I'm going down to the river of Jordan just to bathe my wearisome soul. And if I can just touch the hem of his garment, good Lord, I know that he'll make me whole. I am a pilgrim. And a stranger I'm traveling through This troublesome land I've got a home in That wonderful city And good Lord I know It's not made by hand I am a pilgrim And a stranger I'm traveling through This troublesome land and I've got a home in that wonderful city. The good Lord, and I know, Lord, well, I know it's not made by hand. I've got a home in that wonderful city. The good Lord, I know, Lord, well, I know it's not made by hand.